Do you want to start? Mm -hmm. Welcome everyone to Coral's OER Hangout. My name is Carl Blythe. I'm the director of Coral. That stands for the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. And we produce objects for learning that are open. Uh, that means that they carry a Creative Commons license uh, and that gives you, that gives end users, people who find the object on the internet, that allows them to play this game of open education along with us. What does that mean? Well, in case uh, in, in, the, in foreign language learning, that means that you can take the textbook or take the lesson or whatever it is, the OER, and you can adapt it to your own classroom. Um, and OER, uh, what we're going to talk about today is the notion of inclusivity how to make your language curriculum more inclusive. And there's a strong connection between the concept of openness, open language and inclusivity. Um, as everybody, everybody likes, teachers like to complain all the time about generic textbooks. Textbooks because of, um, well, they're trying to go after market share, the biggest market possible. And in order to do that, commercial publishers often kind of make them more and more genetic, generic. Um, so if you wanted to take your uh, uh, um, let's say a, a textbook and adapt it to your classroom, you would likely include more diversity into that. You'd likely include different kinds of students who have different kinds of interests, who come from different backgrounds and so forth. And the whole point of open education then is to open things up and let more people have access. Um, that's really where it started. So today we have two Spanish instructors uh, Kia London and Jennifer White, and they're going to both talk to us about this concept of inclusivity and how it relates to OER or open educational resources. Um, I should mention at the outset that we have an OER course that really here at Coral, um, you can go to, if you go to our homepage, the Coral homepage, there is a tab that says open education. And, the, and you click on that and we give you lots of links and lots of videos, but we have an entire course that teaches people about the, the, the ins and outs of open education, including how to choose the appropriate license, because there are many different open licenses, um, kinds of research possibilities, all kinds of things that related to OER. Um, but the way we'll do this then, since this is an informal chat with two people here, Kia and Jennifer, um, uh, they're going to talk for, for a little while. Uh, Kia's first up and she'll talk from five to seven minutes and then we'll follow that up with Jennifer. And um, your questions, if you think of something that pops into your head uh, and you want to ask a question to Kia or to Jennifer, go ahead and type that in in the chat box uh, at the bottom of the page there. You just click on that and we will monitor that and make sure that in during at the Q&A at the end, that uh, Kia and Jennifer will get your questions. Okay, that's pretty simple. So Kia, I'm gonna let you have the floor now and let's get going. All right, <clears throat> sounds good. Um, first of all, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Kia London. Um, I've been teaching for about 14 years now, um, Spanish uh, at the elementary, middle and high school level. I'm currently at the middle school level. Um, and I truly enjoy it, truly enjoy uh, sharing my passion for learning um, with my students. Um, it's also a con an excellent connection um, to my ancestry as well. Um, so it's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, so the topic of inclusivity, um, I know on a weekly and a daily basis, um, I make a consistent effort um, to make sure that I am being um, inclusive and that the way I'm presenting materials um, to my students um, has a very inclusive perspective. Um, with the current department that I'm a part of right now, um, there is a textbook. Um, however, what I do, I take a look at the vocabulary and just certain structures that the students need to know and then from there, um, I bring in my own resources that I use, utilize, um, either um, things that I've, I've experienced by traveling abroad or um, either through Teachers Pay Teachers or um, lots of times pictures. Um, so one of the main things for me in the classroom, um, I really make an effort to tie in um, the Afro-Latin culture um, as a part of being inclusive. Um, I grew up um, 
learning um, academic Spanish, although my parents did speak to me in Spanish at home. But um, the academic part started when I was in middle school um, and all the way up through high school and then, of course, college and post-grad. But um, I noticed that the very first time I heard about the African diaspora um, was in college. And I remember being in classrooms where it wasn't even mentioned that it is possible for a person of African descent um, to have um, Latin or Hispanic heritage as well. Um, and I know at that point that just opened up a world of just opportunity for me and it really connected a lot of things. So in terms of connecting that today, um, I utilize pictures with my students. Um, I'd say if, if the goal um, is inclusivity um, and you're just, if, if this is like a new term or, you know, something you want to get a little bit more involved in, I definitely always tell teachers, start with pictures. Um, so with that being said, um, every week uh, we tend to focus on um, a particular person and this particular person can be from an outside experience that I've had. Like for example, the Super Bowl, I thought that was an excellent um, way to be able to tie that into the classroom. Um, and I, we focused on the dance that was being performed um, that uh, Shakira um, learned, the um, champeta. And so with that in mind, being able to tie that in and being able to show a brief glimpse of that dance um, to my students, I was able to um, talk to my students about the background. Um, the important thing is that I really wanted my students to understand where that African connection in, is coming from. Um, and initially when I started the discussion, um, you know, some of them were just like, oh, well, migrating or immigrating? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm sure that there was, there has been some of that since then, but I really brought them back to the very beginning of just Africans that were um, sold into slavery and how now we have a diverse amount of ethnically diverse amount of um, different people. Um, so I think for them, um, they didn't quite realize that, um, but I wanted to make sure that I was able to tie all of that in. Um, so definitely with pictures, um, different people, we do picture talk. Um, if it's a picture, for example, I'm trying to think who we did lately, um, uh, Concha Buica. Concha Buica um, is a singer um, from um, Guinea Equatorial, um, just wonderful singer. She's got a background in, in um, R&B, jazz, blues. And so what I did, I would post up a picture about her. And so um, I would scaffold some questions um, for my students. Um, I teach a lot of novice learners. So between novice and intermediate low, um, and we would do what we call picture talk. Um, for them to be able to talk about that particular picture. And then of course I would tie in, um, you know, other facts about her, where um, Guinea Equatorial is located um, and so forth, um, which also I know from just my experience and um, a few other educators, not all, um, sometimes Guinea Equatorial tends to be overlooked or either not as included as much. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are including um, that particular Spanish speaking country. Um, but I know just with um, different educators that I've um, spoken with, there, there might be a drop of information about that particular um, country, but it's often not as included as it should be um, in the classroom. So those are just a few things, um, pictures. <laughs> Were there any questions? I don't know. If no. Okay. So, <laughs> I was like, do I stop or keep going? Yeah. No, 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 no. That's great, Zia. Thank you so much. Okay. So we'll, we'll come back to your notion of finding pictures, starting with pictures, as you said, the concept of picture talk. I agree with you. I think it's a great place to start to include, you start with images and making, making sure that your images are much more inclusive mm -hmm. and that um, supplement uh, a, a kind of a generic textbook. But Jennifer, uh, let's give it over to you now. So you will talk about the notion of inclusivity in your classroom. <coughs> Her mic is not on. All right. Um, can you hear me? 
Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. All right. Well, so my name is Jennifer White and I'm from the Donahoe School. And the type of school that I work in is a school where it's a uh, more um it's a college prep so a lot of the people pay to come to school and it's that their education is very and, and extremely important i have a hundred percent parent participation so i probably have a different type of experience than a lot of teachers they probably think oh i would love something like that and with that i take advantage of because in my school itself we don't have a lot of diversity but when it comes to diversity with in our city we have the most diverse school as far as indians and chinese and other other places. We don't have hardly any Afro-Latinos, um, but, but I am probably the only one that they know <laughs> in their whole life. So, so I'm from the Dominican Republic. And when I introduce myself to my students, I tell them I am an Afro-Latina. So my mom and dad are from the Dominican Republic, my sister too. She was born in New York and I was born actually there. So I feel like my whole life is a way that I include my uh, inclusivity in my classroom. Because just like uh, Kia was talking about pictures, I use pictures too, but I use it in a different way. I use my family members. Like a lot of times I take a million pictures because I love taking pictures. So I sometimes will post pictures of my family being in a boat stuck in the middle of camp in Panama, you know, it's raining and they, there'll be a picture of my husband, my daughter, and a cousin of mine that's really dark or not that dark or someone that looks Asian and we're all on the same boat. And they'll be like, wait, wait, senora, why are those people are all Afro Latinos? And I'll be like, yeah, that, you know, the one one that's Asian is she's she's from Panama too. All of these people are Panamanian. It's to see for them to see, wow, okay, there's Asian Panamanians, there's Afro Panamanians, there's light skinned Panamanians. It's like it's really cool to see that just in my family alone, I can bring that inclusivity in there. So every time I sit, I do like a worksheet, there's a picture on it. It's like, I don't just give a, a worksheet that's just uh, words on it. I always put a picture, not the ones I print out. If I were ever to give them a, 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 something to print out, like a test, that doesn't have a picture. But anything that I do on Google Classroom, I, I put a picture of food. I put a picture of people dancing. I mean, authentic photos of people dancing, authentic photos of people eating and the food, because I want to provoke the the questions because sometimes um in inclusivity you don't need to like just tell them about it you just need to surround them with it so sometimes i'll say okay we're going to have a guest speaker and it could be about anything let's say if i have a unit on sports i don't have to tell them what color the person is that's coming to speak it could be an afro latino and i never have to even say they're afro latino i could just say okay this person is coming this person is from puerto rico and i want you to meet this person but the person ha happens to be a dark skinned person you know and that's when i like to shock them because it's not we're not in the month of black history we're just talking about sports but it happens to be a person of color so i want them to be able to um, see the people, see Afro Latinos, which I live in Alabama, Anniston, Alabama. We we're in I'm in an area where where the bombing of the bus happened, you know, where the freedom riders are, where blacks and whites are still struggling with their color. People are still saying black boy, black girl kind of stuff. And I happen to be the only person of color in the whole school. So I feel like I have a responsibility to bring the people of color in here, even if it has to be Indian or anything like that. So, um, and even that, um, I like to even bring Afro-Latinos that don't look, that don't look so African. I don't want to be offensive, but sometimes they look like they're Indian. So I like to bring them in here as a guest speaker. I, I always um, ask my community, which I love my community, I'm very involved, but I'm always asking my community, please, whenever you get a chance in the year, when can you come visit my classroom? And if they ever say yes, I move the heaven and earth <laughs> to bring them in, to tie them in the unit, to just bring them in. Like one time I had a friend from Cuba, she actually lives in Cuba. And she showed up because she's a missionary and, um, and she happens to be Afro-Latina. Afro and she says, hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to preach at this church. And I said, wait, can you come to my school tomorrow? I'll make you some empanadas. <laughs> and she's like, oh, yeah, I'll eat your empanadas. So she said, yes. I text my, my supervisor. He said yes. And automatically, if we were talking about, let's say, the unit on, um, let's see, like right now I'm doing Africa, but I'm doing future plans. If I were to do a unit on future plans or the future, I would tell her, hey, can you tie in something about what you would like to do in the future? Or when, when you were younger, what, did, what were your aspirations? What did you want to do? So sometimes hands-on activities are really good. Like Kia was saying about music. I, I love merengue. 
I dance merengue every day. <laughs> so they'll come in the classroom, they hear merengue, they hear salsa, and I'm just dancing even while I'm writing on the board. I kid you not, every one of my students knows how to dance merengue and salsa. And that's why I look crazy right now because I've been sweating <laughs> from dancing. <laughs> Gosh, it's crazy. But we just had a Spanish club meeting and with all those kids, they all said, Senora, why let's, let's do Zumba. Let's, let's have, let's do some salsa and merengue and bachata. I mean, for them to know those words is because I'm constantly saying that, Hey guys, dance this bachata with me. I don't even say, let's learn this vocabulary. I don't say, Oh guys, this is salsa. This is merengue. They just walk in, see me dancing. Hey, come on, do this merengue with me. Hey, you Johnny, get up here, do it. Come on, come on, let's shake it, shake it, shake it. You know, and it's like, okay, sometimes hands-on inclusivity is good. And I, I even like to include, I know this is about Afro-Latinos, but sometimes the Asian Americans or those that are not American, I try to tie the Afro-Latinos and the Hispanic culture to them. Like, you know, I would say, hey, you know that in Panama, there's a section just that, that the Chinese were there, they settled there. And I know a lot of, a lot of Chinese that are Afro Latino Chinese, and they're like, what? And I always try to find a way to connect with all my kids. And sometimes I can't connect in some way, but sometimes there is a way, like with food. It seems like every culture has some kind of beef turnover or, you know, one of those shells that have meat inside and i like to always try to explore you know where did that come from where did um guan arroz con guandules come from this is a mixture of moros y cristianos you know the the mixture of the cultures that's important who are the moors who are and sometimes it's like just using your whole life that's the wonderful thing about being a world language instructor is that the whole world is your classroom and that's my that's my philosophy of teaching is that everything is at my disposal I can ask anybody to come speak about anything because they could bring their whole life with them and just minimize what part I need for them to speak, speak, to, speak about. So, um, so that's what I really do. That's how I do with inclusivity. This is how I involve my students. It's pretty much they're just part of my life. Uh, my kids are, are, are an extension of, my students are an extension of me. I feel like this is my passion. <laughs> Uh, we're planning a quinceañera right now, my daughter, and a lot of quinceañeras are not, I don't see a lot of quinceañeras that are Afro-Latinos, so I made it, I put it upon myself to invite the whole school to the quinceañera, <laughs> Lord help me, but, but this, uh, this quinceañera that I'm planning, it's like the only quinceañera my students will ever go to, mm. and it, it's a great that it's going to be an Afro-Latina child that's going to be doing it, so when they see others, they're not going to be surprised that, oh yeah, yeah, you know, they, they, they're able to do it, they can do it too. So um, I, I guess that's pretty much what, what I would say that it's my inclusivity, how I include Afro-Latinos in everyday, everyday lessons, not just um, once a month, because once a month is not good enough. And like he was saying, she'll, she'll introduce people and everything like when uh, that show, that, that movie, that mini series from Netflix came out, when they see us, you know, it was an English miniseries on Netflix and it was explosive and it was heartbreaking, but some of my students saw it. And when they came to class and said, oh my goodness, this is, this made me cry. I would say, hey, you know that the main character in that movie is Dominicano? <laughs> and they'll be like, what? And then we start researching. Hey, yeah, he's Dominican, grew up in New York. And it's like, I'm always trying to tie the, the Afro-Latino culture to anything that they might be interested in. If it's the baseball players, I always tell them, hey, you know, you know, um, baseball is my national sport back home, you know, look at Sami Sosa and I mean, look at all these people. And then what they end up doing is that they, co they come to me with these conversations. Hey, did you see how this guy struck out the other day, Senora White? And I'm like, look, I don't watch baseball anymore, but, but that's pretty cool that they go out of their way to tell me that they're interested in the subjects I'm bringing up to them that before me, like, you know how before Christ, after Christ is like, before Senora White, after Senora White, before me, they didn't know anything. They didn't know anybody, wouldn't approach anybody of color. But then after Senora White, which I'm not trying to give myself, you know, any credit at all. It's just that I'm saying it's so good as teachers that we have that power that we can always say, hey, look, um, you can do more than this. No matter how rich you are and no matter how many countries you visited, you still can continue learning. And that's what my students do a lot. They, for spring break, they're leaving. They're trying to leave the country, even though the coronavirus is going on. They're trying to leave the country. They always travel, but they always send me these little messages. Hey, 
I'm over here in Bahamas and I met a Dominicano and he's, he looks just like you. And it's like, wow, that just warms my heart when they say, hey, I, I, I ate an empanada or I, I spoke Spanish. And it's always something that, that as world language instructors, we, we just have like this just special power. Don't you think that, you know, we just mm -hmm. have that? Yeah, it's like, it's just, we can do whatever we want. <laughs> if, we're, if, we don't, if we have the liberty, of course, if we don't have the right... Um, the right uh, leadership before us. And I guess we won't, and I'm been blessed to be able to have good leadership and, and I've been able to uh, do as much as I could. And when I say I do whatever I want, it's not that I just, I'm crazy and I just don't have any discipline. It's just that I can have teachable moments and I don't let those pass. So, so do you have any questions or anything? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of questions actually coming in. So. Oh, really cool. <laughs> yeah. So let me uh, get things going. I'm going to ask a question. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. That was really great. And um, I can tell that both of you are really wonderful teachers because you bring so much of yourself into the classroom. Um, you just said something, Jennifer, we can do so much. It's wonderful to be a, a world language teacher because we can do, we can do all these things. And um, it, uh, both of you were talking about a particular kind of uh, well, expanding the curriculum to include Afro-Latinos, which is fine. But of course, inclusivity is a huge topic and in, you can take it in many different directions. And so um, I was also, because I was thinking of the first thing that came to my mind was inclusive language and the whole Latinx phenomenon, how people are trying to think about gender in a different way and how to be more inclusive uh, about gender varieties. Do any of you touch on that topic? Um, I have, I've, I've brought it up in my class because I don't want my kids to be ignorant. So I bring it up. I talk about colorism. I talk about Latinx and I bring it up. My kids are those type of kids that they, they won't engage in conversations that they feel uncomfortable with. And it seems like with the community that I'm part of, I haven't had a good conversation yet. It's like, I haven't been successful to be able to bring out and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or, or what do you think about the genders and everything? And they're just not there. We're not in a big city like Atlanta or, or New mm -hmm. York where mm -hmm. they, feel, you, they feel comfortable. These are kids that are, how can I say? They're like, um, uh, <laughs> they're like the parents put them here so, they're, so they can be, um, safe from a lot of things. Not that I'm telling you that the genders are not safe. I'm just saying that most of the people here are pretty much the same people. And a lot of um, people that attend church or are part very religious and, um, and I haven't been able to get there. So it's something that I haven't been able to hit. Just like what, sometimes when I talk about racism, same thing, because that ties in with that. And when I talk about racism and I talk about black people being abused, I have that problem that they don't, they don't like to really talk about it because they feel like this guilt. And I, I don't know how to fix that. I maybe I need more years um, with my group, but I haven't been able for them to to open up as much to tell me, hey, I don't believe in that or I don't think about that. They just pretty much stay quiet. So maybe uh -huh. Kiev has more success with, with that question. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely like Jennifer, like we have very similar experiences. So um, I, I am the only teacher of African descent in my school. Mm -hmm. So I feel like just some of the conversations that Jennifer was just sharing, like I've had to kind of ease my way like into those conversations um, with my students because the population um, predominantly white. However, it is becoming a little bit more ethnically diverse. Um, so I know this year, especially, I'm gonna go back to pictures. Um, I, we did a short story on um, Zendaya and what I purposely did to initiate and engage them in some conversation, I put a picture of her um, with her hair curly in just her natural state. Um, because I think a lot of the students have seen her with her hair where it's blown out or either straightened. And I know immediately with one particular group, it was, oh, what happened to her hair? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? What do you mean what happened to her hair? And so, um, you know, I was able to engage them in a little bit of dialogue of just like, well, nothing's wrong with her hair. It's just, it's curly. It's in her natural state. 
Mm-hmm. You know, is there a certain type of hair that you feel um, is better than the other? Um, so we really, you know, and that's just really like how I've kind of been touching on certain things. Um, I know recently our district, um, last year actually, they had um, a specialist come in and talk to the teachers about um, um, cisgender and transgender um, students. And so um, I know recently this year, we had another um, professional workshop um, about it just with our staff. And the thing about it with the Latinx movement, um, I've known for a while, like I've, I've read, I've... Um, co-presented with different um, teachers um, that um, have more information on that when it comes to um, the cisgender um, pronouns. And so I think for a while I kind of held it for a little bit because I was like, "Uh, let me see, you know. So the minute after the staff met and had, you know, like a training or presentation, then I started introducing it to my students. And just as Jennifer said, like I put it up there of just, okay, so you know, you know, this is what this means. Um, and I did ask them, like, how many of you all have seen the E as the ending? And some of them did, you know, mm-hmm. and some of them didn't quite know what that meant. So that's how I've presented it. And I've told them, you know, if you feel you want to use this as an option, that's perfectly fine. But this is just for you to know, you know, mm-hmm. FYI. Great. Thank okay. you so much. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in from people. So I just wanted to address some of those. Um, someone asked, do you have texts in Spanish that talk about colorism, poems or narratives? Um, and, and Roberto suggested Black in, in Latin America by Henry Louis Gates Jr. But um, do you have any other ideas, Jennifer or Kia? Um, I know that uh, we, ha- we do have a Facebook group called Incorporating Afro-Latino Culture in Spanish Classrooms. It's, uh, anybody's welcome to join that group. We have great, great people in there, and it's teachers like you and me, and every time they encounter a certain topic with Afro-Latinos, um, colorism, they put it on that page, and that's where I've gotten a lot of my resources, so I really need you to join that page if you ca- can. It's called Incorporating Afro-Latino Culture in Spanish Classrooms, and just get in that, get in there, and we've been around for about a year, so if you scroll down, you'll find a lot of information about, uh, about, um, about colorism, Black in Latin America. Henry Louis Gates is something that I'm very, very uh, big fan of his, so that's where I first started. That's where I found out that I was Black, like I didn't know I was Black, <laughs> so I know that sounds funny, but I didn't know I was Black until I, I played a video like that when I was doing student teaching, and when one of the girls that was my color said, uh, you know, she, he asked the, the girl, tu eres negra? And she's like, yeah, and I was like, oh my gosh, and in the middle of the class, I started crying. I was like, like oh my gosh, I gotta t- get it together. If she's black and she's Mexican, and I never thought of a Mexican as black, then that means I'm black. And then as a Dominican, Dominican people don't say they're black. <laughs> so I've never been told I was black. So I, I really I really look for those um, titles. And when I see students that are like me, that they don't consider themselves that, I'm not trying to push it on them, but I'm trying to show them that, hey, there's other people like you out there and they consider themselves black. So... Anyway, but please look at that Facebook page because it has so much information. I couldn't even begin to tell you. It's really good. Great. And I, I want to bring to people's attention that when things come up, we're trying to put it into the chat, bo- chat room. So you see that Sarah has just given you the link for the Afro-Latino culture, including Afro-Latino culture in the Spanish classroom. So boom, there it is. Uh, thanks for that tip. Uh, yeah, we had another good uh, recommendation from Ziva about finding pictures. Um, uh, you can go to organizations websites like SOS Racismo or uh, places like that. So that sounds like good advice. Um, let's see what other questions we have. Oh, so Ziva also asked, what do you guys do to include history and culture that is not dance related? So I think you already kind of talked about other things, but are there other, like, maybe I think you mentioned food already. Um, What other cultural things do you like sharing with your students? Um, I know for me, like, I, we use a lot of stories. Um, we, We use a lot of stories. And I know right now, 
the textbook that I have right now, there's, um, they have an option for you to utilize stories alongside, you know, the grammar and the vocab. So I'll take those stories. Um, and then what I'll do, I might change some things. Um, I might change the name um, of the person or either where the person is from, especially if I want to highlight um, a particular um, Spanish speaking country that's uh, that can be seen as like overlooked. Um, so that's one way that I really um, work to engage the students through stories. Um, and then that way we can at least, you know, talk about where the country is and um, where it's located. Um, I know recently I did that um, with uh, one particular story with my novice learners. Um, it, I changed the location to um, Guinea Equatorial um, and I gave the character um, the name um, Omar which happens to be a very common name um, in that particular country. Um, and I know initially the story was centered around someone that was um, from Spain. And I just really wanted to make sure and touch on that particular country um, that can be often overlooked or so. But stories are a great way um, mm -hmm. to um, include into your, um, your instruction as well. Mm -hmm. Someone actually mentioned too that they look at critical representations of race in telenovelas. I don't know if either of you have done that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really important too. Um, if you're using uh, telenovelas or any type of series um, or even just literature, you do want to be mindful of um, the type of representation that's being portrayed um, because you don't necessarily want to fall have a character that falls into what people are used to seeing, like that stereotype of someone that is um, of African descent. So that's really, really important as well. Yeah, I think there's a good one. There's a good um, telenovela called Bolivar, which is not one that you can show the students, but if you know, if you've seen it before, you can go ahead and uh, fast forward certain parts um, of that. But yeah, telenovela is, is really, really a good way of, of teaching history. They have a good stories. So that, that, that question brought up the notion of criticality or taking a look at, at colorism um, as it may exist in the target culture, not just our culture, um, but then kind of going a little bit deeper. And I was wondering if either one of you have looked at your own textbooks as kind of having an ideology or a particular perspective. Is that too uh, risky? Oh, my textbook is not very good. <laughs> I, I really don't. Well, exactly. That's the point. I don't point. like my that's... textbook at all. Right. My textbook has no pictures on it. I mean, that's even worse. But the textbook <laughs> in the past, um, yeah, they don't, they don't include a lot of things. And um, even going back to one of the telenovelas that we watch, it's called Silvana Sin Lana. And um, I, I would looked at that and and I even went to an actual presentation that said, oh, this, this telenovela is very diverse. But what they were talking about diversity, they were saying that a girl has red hair, red curly hair, one has blonde, one has black hair. Uh, and I thought that's diversity for you. Okay, I guess it would be, but no, <laughs> you know, so I sent a letter to Telemundo right away. I was like, what are you guys doing? I mean, this does not portray Miami. I grew up there and that they're saying that that's Miami. And I'm like, that's not Miami. And they actually filmed in my high school, Miami High. And I was like, Miami High does not look like that. The students I went to school with did not look like that. And, and sometimes, you know, you have to be that teacher to write that mean letter to a network and say, why isn't there more representation of people of color or of different, of different people that just, just one, one class of people and they don't respond. But I did get to, um, since I was able to speak out on that, the person that presented an actful about, I forgot what was the name. I was called Edu Novela. She uses uh, Silvana Singlana as part of, uh, they do homework, they watch it. Um, they kind of clean it up and the kids can watch it and learn Spanish and they love this type of homework. So if you've ever heard of Edu Novela, it's really good, um, but they don't have any people of color. But ever since I complained, now they make sure even some of the avatars are black <laughs> and they make sure they have got people with curly hair. And then the lady that manages that, now she's constantly looking for um, 
product that has include more inclusivity, more uh, people of color, more more diversity. So um, so I think that that's um, that's something that we we do, we do need to speak up as teachers. We don't have a lot of time to write letters, but sometimes when it's it involves your kid, if your kids it involves your content, your 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 life, then it's good to just go ahead and send a letter and complain because more of us complain then maybe the networks would change. Yeah, that's great to hear. It sounds like it can work actually. Uh, we have other good recommendations from people. Uh, Roberto shared a few links if you want to talk about political uproar in different countries um, and tie it to the text in the time of the butterflies. I don't know what level that is um, or if, if you guys have used that in your classes. Yeah, I used that book uh, one year. It was a little hard for my Spanish three. I had to read it with them. And then I gave them a portion of it to read um, for the summer. And then we watched the movie. Um, the good thing about that book is that um, it talks about Trujillo and that that was the dictator of the Dominican Republic and how he killed so many Haitians and um, and how these uh, butterflies, these three women, the, Miralba, the Mirabal sisters are now heroes. Um, but this legacy is still continuing like in the Dominican Republic as we speak, Trujillo's, the dictator's great grandchild is running for president. So it's like, whoa, this is like history repeating themselves. And thank God I, I brought up that book to my, it was my Spanish three, but now that they're in college, they're writing to me and saying, oh no, Trujillo's running for president. <laughs> it's like, no, don't vote. And we're like, well, we don't know what he's up to. You know, he grew up in the United States, but it's so cool how you brought up historic facts um, in Spanish class. And then it's like, it's catching up to you. It's like, whoa, we're hearing the word Trujillo again. We're hearing, hearing his name. And okay, what does he think of Haitians now? And what is the conflict with Haiti and the Dominican Republic? And, and it's something that, oh my goodness, we're, we're continuously writing history, even though we read it and they haven't, you know, let's say not much has changed, but, um, but it's good to involve the kids in that. That Mirabal sister and the time of the butterflies is really good, really good text. It is really hard. It's not one of those that you can just assign. It would be better to watch the movie, study it, show them, put them in stories. Like Kia says, I love that idea. Putting things in story, maybe write it yourself and narrate it or do it like a story time, a little at a time, and then ask them questions. But as far as the movie, you can show that. There's nothing vulgar that I know of of, of that movie. Okay, thanks. Uh, and then we just had another good tip from Esther, and this is similar to what you both said, Kia and Jennifer, about just including things. You don't always have to call attention to something. You can just kind of slip it in there and the students will notice. So she said the same thing about um, including different kinds of families, single mothers and dads, same-sex partners, and things like that um, to Carl's question about gender. Uh, let's see what other questions we had. Uh, someone said Palenque culture is a good representation in cultural aspects. I'm apologies for my pronunciation there. Um, so that's another piece of advice. Uh, someone else said, Ziva said, I introduce my students to Latin American history and the legacy of slavery in Spanish one, usually so that they understand the huge diaspora and then racial concepts. Do you do things like this or have any advice on how you talk or introduce links between the history of slavery to first place Africans in every country so sounds like they're asking yeah just how do you introduce the concept of slavery to, to very beginner students in all the different countries um i'm trying to well i know since i've since my students are accustomed to um now um Afro-Latin culture and um, the different um, multifaceted aspects of it. Um, I was, and it's funny because I felt a little bit of fear about this for some reason, but they're novice learners. Um, I'm not necessarily sure um, what their curriculum is like for history or, you know, social sciences, but I really, again, it began with that question of just, okay, so where did the term, what, why do we have Afro-Puerto Ricans or why do we have Afro-Cubans? What's the connection? And I, that was how I presented it. Um, 
at the time. And it was, I want to say it was around the time where um, we were talking about a picture and or, or a story. I can't remember offhand. Um, and I waited, you know, and that's when some of those answers came. Well, was it migration or is it, you know, immigration? Um, I can probably count on my head that two students, on my hand, two students actually knew that it had something to do with slavery. So I don't know if a lot of the students knew, but they just weren't necessarily comfortable to kind of say something. Um, but that's really how I presented that question. And again, this was, you know, after so many classes of introducing them and showcasing um, the Afro Latin culture. Um, just being able to see if that can make the, if they can make that connection. Um, and if it's something that you're doing for the first time, you know, maybe start out with expectations of just, okay, we're going to, you know, talk about something um, historically. Let's just remember to be mindful of different perspectives and so forth, you know, um, however it is that you want to phrase it. But that was really how I, you know, preface the question to them. And uh, they were, they were pretty quiet. You know, it was just like, oh, slavery, you know, so, but it, you know, it's history. So, yeah. And actually, the person who asked that question said that she teaches at the university level too. So I imagine it would, it might differ a little bit depending on who the students are and how old they are too. Although I'm sure university students might not always make that connection. Um, does anyone? Yeah. Jennifer, what were you going to say? Oh, I was okay. no, I was going to say that just like Kia, that I have the same issue. If I bring up slavery, nobody wants to talk about that. I, like I said, I talked about guilt before. Like I, I just feel like they start, you know, just looking away and not, not wanting to bring that up. But I, what I did this year that was different when I presented at ACTFL was that I, I gave everybody a questionnaire, all the kids, and I said, what, what do you and Senora White have similar, you know, like a questionnaire about stuff that you wanna know about these kids. What, how much do they know about slavery? How much do they know about, about blacks? And, cause there's none in your class. I only have like three black students in, my, in the whole school. So I asked them, I said, what do you, uh, what are the similarities of you and Senora White? Um, uh, what is your heritage? Do you know what that is? Do you know what uh, racism is? And what, what is that to you? And it's something that is very private. I told them, write it down. You don't have to even put your name on it. Just write it down. And then I had to like read that and see where they're at. And even with reading, they're not wanting to open up. This is in the low level. We're talking about Spanish one level. And no, they don't, they don't want to open up yet. It's like Kia says, after a long time that they know you well, then you can openly talk about it. And I, like, just like she said, it's history. You bring it up. So after that, that's when I bring up Spain and Africa. What's the relationship? I said, what's up with these two countries? Hey, what's up with them? Motherland number one, motherland number two. Hey, those are my two mothers. Why, why they have so much conflict? Because we're mixed. We're right in the middle. And that's, I bring it up like I'm in the middle of two mothers. And then that's how I start saying, okay, this is how it started. And I don't know if you learned this in history, but the slave and I start talking about the slave ship and where they went. And I give them fun facts too. Like, hey, did you know that more slaves went to Brazil than to the United States? And that's how we started. And when I start with like fun facts and we do a cahoot about it and maybe it could open up a little bit. Um, not, I'm just trying to get that relationship with my kids open. Not that I'm trying to make fun or make it that this is fun, that slavery is fun. Just trying to make it where I need them to open up so that they can talk. But Spanish one really is not is not the the level where they they feel maybe comfortable with you unless they know you and they know everybody in that room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And do you do all that? Do you do a lot of that in English then too, or is that all in the in Spanish? I do it. In, I do it in English. Okay. So yeah, I, I say that in those kinds of things I say in English, but in, in between I speak Spanish. So it's like, mm -hmm. I'll be like, blah, 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 blah. And then I'll say, si, porque de, de donde soy, tengo dos madres. I have two mothers. And I'll speak like that in Spanish one, when I'm trying to get a point across about something about history, yeah. then I'll say it in English and Spanish. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Thanks. Uh, okay, so we have one other piece of advice from Roberto. This is a good idea. He says, um, you can also introduce Afro-Latino culture uh, through fashion. So I don't know if you guys have tried that at all, but um, he shared a link. That sounds like a fun way of introducing it. Uh, does anyone else have any more questions? I think I've gone through all the questions now. 
people are sharing a lot of really good tips in the chat. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're talking about something, um, the difficulty of talking about difficult topics. I mean, the idea of either stigma or guilt, uh, it brings up a lot of, uh, it stirs up a, a lot of emotion. And so I think both of you are talking about how to handle these things in, um, uh, you know, kind of an open way, but also in a, um, in a way that's level appropriate to them. I mean, we're not, it's not at a university level, let's say, but you're talking about middle school. So I'm just struck by how, you know, kind of complicated it is because uh, you're introducing new territory, new ideas that they probably don't have a lot of background to talk about and to unpack. So yeah, can we say an, a critical discussion of, yeah, but they, they really need, it sounds like they just need a lot of scaffolding to help them really not only analyze the, the facts on the ground, what they may be in the Dominican Republic, but even what they think about it themselves in their own cult. This is probably really unexplored territory for them in their own culture, which is the whole purpose of world language, world languages, because it, it gets them to explore those areas that are usually pretty unexplored. But it, it calls for, I don't know, I guess what I'm trying to say is it calls for a set of skills um, that go beyond what most teachers often think is what's required in a language classroom. That is so true. I know that with us, um, my school was formed mainly because um, there was, um, you know how they had segregation and then when when they came together, the blacks and the whites came together um, for the first time, then my school was created. And it was created, what they said, have told me is that they have created it so they could be a safe, a safe environment for kids. But I'm still digging up to see who was the first black kid that ever came to the school. And, and I, I tell these kids, it's like, just like you said, it's like, it, it, it opens these wounds that they don't know they have. Cause then a lot of my kids, especially the, my white kids say, I don't have a culture. We don't have all of that stuff. We don't have that. When you're saying about heritage and traditions, what is that? And it's like, you have them. You do something every year. You do it at the same time every year. You give out gifts. You do, there, you do have culture. But sometimes when we bring them all this culture and all this information, they feel like they're lacking a bit. And then they're feeling like, okay, um, you know, what's wrong with us? And then sometimes they go back home and ask parents, where are we from? I do have a heritage project and they have to go back several generations as far as they can to find out where they came from. And most parents, they come back and they're like, uh, we don't know. We've been in Alabama all our lives or we were in New York after that and we don't know where. And it's like, is the parents haven't told the kids that they're from England somewhere or Irish, maybe. A lot of the kids, some, some of them cry because they don't know. And, and in a language classroom, I've noticed that this is probably like a safe place. And it has to be a place where the students have to trust their teacher, just like music teachers have a relationship with the band kids and the sports have a relationship with those athletes. It's like the world language teacher has to have a special relationship with kids where the kids can be open to come and ask these questions. And, and you want them to dig into their culture where they grow up and they know who they are. And it's, I, sometimes I feel like if I'm trying to teach them who they are. Like, come on guys, you gotta know who you are. And they're like, we don't know who we are. And that sometimes that just breaks my heart. That is like the parents are not really as, as affluent as they are and as traveled as they are and as smart and with so much money, like they don't know who they are. And it's like, they're hiding things from them. And sometimes that's kind of tough to break through. I want to make one last comment. Um... I think I attended a, a talk by um, a Spanish teacher about uh, this, the same topic, inclusivity. I believe it was at Actful. And um, she was making the comment that when people talk about inclusivity, they typically focus on race, just as, as we've been talking about kind of eth ethnicity and race that comes to mind. But she was saying that in textbooks, and commercially produced textbooks in particular, that there's kind of like a tourist or a marketing angle. You want to show the pretty pictures of all the, the popular places to go. So the beaches and the best places in the, in the cities and so forth. And she said that her job, she, she thought, I want to work against that and to try to show a more authentic representation of the various cultures and, and, and um, countries that, that she was talking about. So she said, um, yes, I am trying to, to 
to get more race, racial diversity, but I'm also trying to include people with disabilities or poor people. I mean, you're never gonna talk, it's always the middle class family or the upper middle class family. So essentially she was saying there is definite stereotypes in textbooks and my attempt at inclusivity is just to work against that, to kind of deconstruct it and show all of these countries are so much more complicated than that book that you are holding in your hands lets you, leads you to believe. And I thought that was a really good way of thinking about it. Um, she even said, I remember she said, I'm a vegetarian and it drives me crazy. And she's Latina. I'm a vegetarian. It drives me crazy. All these enchiladas and all this kind of stuff that I don't eat any of that stuff. So she said, I do a whole unit on vegetarianism in Latin America. So, I mean, the whole point is, you know, inclusivity just keeps going and going and going. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's any, any any last questions or recommendations? I don't see any more questions. Oh, okay. Well, um, let's wrap things up right now then. And I want to bring to people's attention, not only as I mentioned at the outset of our OER course, we have an entire course devoted to OER. And even though we've been talking about inclusivity, we are, we are linking that to the notion of openness. Open education literally means to break down barriers so that we give more people access to education, number one. So for example, textbooks can be quite expensive and we have this wonderful thing called the internet and um, our two teachers, Kia and Jennifer, were talking about bringing in content into the classroom. So that's a great example of, of uh, using the open resources available on the internet. Um, so take a look at that uh, course. Uh, also, we have something called LEARN, L-O-E-R-N, and that's essentially a network of teachers who are using OER, creating OER, and we want to make sure that um, we give you credit for that if you're an OER developer, and then put you in touch with other people in the OER world. And finally, um, Coral is a... U.S. Department of Foreign Language Resource Center, and all our money comes from the U.S. Congress. So we have to make sure that what we're doing is uh, having an impact on the community. So would you please take this real quick uh, survey? Uh, you have the URL. It only takes about five minutes. They're just a series of real quick questions, and uh, we need that for our gathering of information for the federal government. I want to thank our uh, two speakers today, Kia London and Jennifer White. You guys sound like absolutely awesome teachers, and uh, you're, you're teaching your students a lot more than just Spanish. So thanks for hanging out with us and talking about the wonderful world of OER. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. The link, to the, the link to the survey is also in the chat room. Right. It, don't, it literally only takes five minutes. Do it right now. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you so much. Bye -bye.